is a treasure chest. Understand the one God. You open up the treasure chest of other great gifts from this God. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Moses told that the daily diet of the Jews would be to hear every morning, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thousands, a few thousand of years later, Jesus is asked by some men, would you tell us what is the greatest commandment of all? The first and the greatest. He said, it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is no disputing the one God doctrine. Throughout the Bible, thousands of times, over 7,000 times to be exact, the Bible refers to God as being one God, one Lord. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the place where that the Lord Jesus Christ, who was none other than Jehovah, covered with uh, Hebrew flesh, he is declaring before the whole world, I'm going to build my church. Right. He didn't say anything about churches. He said, this upon this rock, the rock Christ Jesus, I am going to build my church. Okay? And he said, the gates of hell shall never, uh, shall not prevail against it. And this is very affirmative. It is very positive. He said, shall never prevail against it. And that means exactly what it says. Brings me to this thought. There are teachings in the world today where that some people believe that the church it was founded in Acts 2, 1 to 4 and Acts 2, 38. There are some people who erroneously believe that after AD 100 that the church perished. I'm going to uh, denounce that thought. I'm going to tell you that's not true. I'm going to tell you that Jesus' words did not lie when they said, the gates of hell shall never prevail against my church, and if his church had died, he would have been wrong. Yes. Right. Can you see this? Yes. If the church had died, as some oneness apostolics, uh, uh, even some oneness apostolics allege, mm -hmm. then, then Jesus was in error. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely, he would have been in error. Mm -hmm. But God's word is eternal. It's forever set in heaven. He cannot be wrong. Now, on, in Acts the second chapter, 2-1-4, to four, uh, on the day of Pentecost, the 50th day after the great uh, feast of the Passover, God started his church. There came tongue speaking, as you all know about, you have it, and in uh, our ecclesiology, the doctrinal structure of the church started in the 38th verse, uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost the promises unto uh, you and your children and all of those you might say in Norwich yes. and I'm not in error when I would say it that way yes. all, all that are far off right. Norwich and uh, that uh, Cumberland did you say Cumberland thank God amen 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 Detroit name it uh, El Paso, it doesn't matter what city it is. Uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard, thank God. Uh, those wonderful, wonderful little people down there. I never knew that God could save so many people in a bookstore. Uh, uh, and God saves people uh, no matter how far off. Uh, Brother Lut Rutledge, right down here in the end of the 20th century, God is saving people. Okay. That's right. Someone says to you, what are you? What do you answer? If they say, what is the name of your church? A lot of people don't know what to answer. You may say apostolic, and they'll look at you and blink and say, uh, apa, apa, apple what? And uh, so you say, I'm apostolic. Well, they don't know what that is. Many people don't even know. Now you tell them all about Martin Luther, they know all about Martin Luther. 
They know all about the Mr. Pope, and I'm not going to speak. They know about that. And they know all about Jim Baker. And they know all about Mr. Swaggart. And they know about Mr. Oral Roberts and his flub up a couple of years ago. And they know, but they don't know too much about you. And they don't know what they're missing. If you would put the right name on your church, what you are and what I am, you are members of the primitive Judaic Christian church. You may want to write that down. Now, you asked me to come here and teach. And so I'm going to teach you, and I'm really going to drill... I'm really going to try to drill some things in you in the next... Give me an hour. Uh, give me just about an hour. Please don't walk out. Give me an hour. Because if I don't, if I don't get this into you tonight and these things, I may never... I may miss them. You, uh, most of you have pencil and paper, and there's some words that I'm going to pull on you. Not fancy etymology. I didn't come here for that. But there are some things in religious history that you need to know. And if you will write down these things, I'm going to teach you how to find your history in libraries. And if you don't know four words that I'm going to teach you, you'll never find it. I don't care who you are. And that is why we do not know our history. I'm going to show you the key tonight. There is a key, and it took me about 20 years to find it too. All right, but till we get there. We are actually the primitive Judaic Christian church, and the word Judaic means Jewish. So we are the primitive, and the word primitive does not mean old, discrepant, falling apart, or coming unglued. It means that it is first and original. That is, in uh, in our dictionaries or rhetoric, it is first, original, the and we are the Orthodox Church. We are the Orthodox Church. Now the others talk about Orthodox and Orthodoxy. They don't know the meaning of the word. We are the Orthodox Church. And the word orthodox also means original, that which is first. Yes. Praise the Lord. We're the orthodox church. Yes. They're not. Right. They don't know what they're talking about, and we do. That's it. All right. Now, so, go with me to um, Jude. Now, the church started in uh, A.D. 33, and it started in Jerusalem. Let's all say A.D. 33. A.D. 33. And it started in Jerusalem. And it started in, in Jerusalem. It didn't start in Rome, and it did not start with uh, Mary Eddie Baker in uh, Boston. It did not start with uh, the Mormons in Ogden, Utah. Amen to God. It started in Jerusalem in A.D. 33. Yes. And I want to tell you now, without offense, our church, no offense meant now, our church did not start at Azusa Street. You're right. You're right. Right. I don't feel any bricks coming at me. No, right. Our church didn't start at Topeka, Kansas. Our church started in Jerusalem. And it was not revived there. Now there was a revival that broke out in Topeka. Well, it ought to have. Yeah. So what's so new about it? It ought to have had a revival. Yes, sir. You're right. So they had a revival in Los Angeles. Good. They ought to have. Sure. It was about time. Yeah. Thank God. But don't, don't go off the deep end and say that started everything off. It didn't. No. It was another great revival. Uh-huh. And before I get done here in the next, in the week that you hear me teach, I'm going to convince you in the name of Jesus Christ that there has been thousands of revivals down through each and every century and our church did not die. Our church did not die. Our church did not die. Thank God. Jesus said, this is my church. And the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. And uh, uh, we're going to show you plenty, plenty of grounds that you may safer believe and uh, uh, look up many of the references, hundreds of them in those three, four books. And uh, you will see the documentation where I got my information from, and I'm going to show you a lot of it in the next tonight, and uh, mainly tomorrow night, though, or uh, when we, uh, that'd be Thursday night. All right. Jude, now the great church started, and it was about, we'll, we'll say A.D. 33. And then you read the book of Jude, and you look up there, and it says A.D. 66. 
So Jude lived for about 33 years after the day of Pentecost. And suddenly, in verse 3 and 4, he is crying out. He said like this, Jude 3, 4, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it is needed for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Hallelujah. Why? Why, Jude? Yes. What's gone wrong? Something, an alarmist is crying out. Jude is an alarmist. He cried out, Oh, Lord God, brethren, brethren, something's gone wrong. He was like a blue jay. You get up in the morning, did you ever hear a noisy, raucous blue jay just squawking and tearing up everything and you want to sleep in? Okay, he was, uh, uh, they are alarmists in that kingdom. All right, now then, Jude was an alarmist. He said, brethren, something's gone wrong. And then in the first, fourth verse, he gets, For there are certain men crept in, unaware, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, something that's unclean. And he said, And denying the only Lord God. They denied the only Lord God. They wanted something else. Right. They wanted more than one. So they denied the only one. Yes. Notice that. Right. The only Lord God. Yes. They wanted something more than that. Yes. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. This is, so Paul preached, Peter preached, John, James, Jude, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, and uh, um, all of the apostles preached and they preached and they preached and they lived to preach. And they probably all died preaching. Every one of them went to their deaths except St. John and he died possibly of old age in Asia, Asia Minor after coming back from Patmos. I've only seen Patmos. I wasn't there, but I've seen it. Seen it from the air anyway. And uh, so the apostles have mostly passed. And Jude cried out. He said, after 33 years, among all the masses of people that are saved all over Turkey, and all over the Eastern Hemisphere, wherever it was theologically accessible, they preached and they preached. And we'll prove it to you. Now I'm going to prove it to you. All right, and where they went, we're going to follow the pathway of the apostles with historical documents, and we will let you read it. And you can see for yourself. But as they preached, there were masses of people that came in bigger numbers than you and I have ever dreamed possible got saved I have here um, from uh, an archaeological mu uh, magazine that I found and it is on page about 45 to about 66 it's in an archaeological magazine where they were digging recently in Laodicea and uh, Aphrodisias and another city right there. There, Here is Laodicea and Pilastra uh, uh, is back this way and Aphrodisia is here. They're, they're what we call tri-cities. I've been there. I was in the only church area that I wasn't at was um, uh, I didn't see Sardis and I didn't see Philadelphia. The other Ephesus, Fergus, I've been there. And at Laodicea, I've seen these many of these things. Now, I wasn't on the archaeological dig. But what they are doing now, they're, um, Aram, a man named K.E. Aram, he is digging over there right now. And uh, he was an ambassador to the U.S., highly educated, and he is a reputable writer. I have his great book. And he is digging right in there where I was. And he wrote, and others have written, that there were Tannerbaum and other men, uh, archaeologists, they're saying perhaps there were millions of people like Cornelius. Yes. Cornelius was saved in Acts the tenth chapter. Now I'm giving you this preliminary uh, idea of the number that uh, they are now finding as they dig up cities, ancient cities, and they are. At Sardis they're digging up brand beautiful churches and um, uh, Laodicea, Aphrodisia, and Palastra, and those places in there. 
And they are saying now, we've greatly underestimated the number of people that were saved like Cornelius. Yes. Now, Cornelius was of your religion. Yes, that's right. He was. He was saved according to the doctrine of, and that's what you and I are. Yes. Now then, I, I'm bringing that out so that you may know that by the end of the first century, you can write it down that we are finding where they are saying by the end of A.D. 100, there were perhaps millions of the Judaic Christian people. Yes. And they met all the way from uh, Jerusalem to Ephesus and from es Ephesus to the, uh, what they call the um, um, Oasis of Sikian. And that is, I found that. And they said there were people saved all the way from Ephesus to the uh, oasis of Sikian in China. And we're going to teach on that, and I'm going to tell you now, we have underestimated our great heritage. Yes. You've underestimated. Most of you are new saints, I'm assuming anyway. But we have done one big thing that's wrong. We've underestimated the greatness of our legacy. We've underestimated the great number of the Jesus name apostolic people through the ages. Yes. And, and so that is going to be the gist of my uh, things that I try to teach in the next few nights. We were greater in number. We were the church until the year of 1233. Yes. We were the church. We were bigger than Roman Catholicism. I won't be, you won't hear me speaking evil of any church, but I am going to meet, mention uh, now and then the Roman faith community, which will be the uh, Catholic say If I don't say Catholic and I say Roman faith community, you know what I'm talking about. We were the church. They were not. We were the church that the world did not recognize as a church. But we are anyhow. And they don't recognize you very much either. It's only this year and under good Mr. Bush, and I'm glad he's in. Um, it is under good Mr. Bush, at least to me, uh, that's my thinking. Uh, he did get in, and he is our president. It's only now that we're recognized as uh, an apostolic religion of antiquity, thank God, going back through the ages. And only now are we recognized as apostolics. We are not Jewish. We are not Catholic. We are not Protestant. What are you? I'm of the Judaic Christian Church. Yes. yes. Thank God. Hallelujah. We're apostolics. Yes. All right. And so there were millions of them by the end of the first century, and you can quote that now. We now have it. You've got to find it written. I cannot just come here and tell you something. I have to find it. I have to read it. I have to say, here is where I got it from. Here, go look it up for yourself if you don't believe me. And I know, I know you'll believe me. But we're going to give you many, many dozens and dozens of things. As All right. So millions uh, came into the church. Paul preached at Ephesus, and I've been at Ephesus, and I've seen the site where... Paul's great church, the, the archaeologist told me over there is where it was. It was out in front of the great uh, theater, the great theater on Peon Mountain uh, and the, uh, the street, uh, Cutler Street comes down that way and the other street that goes down to the sea goes out. You've seen pictures of it, the big street at Ephesus. And here is the great amphitheater. Well, out where the street comes this way and goes that way, Right over that way, about a block or two blocks, was what they called the, um, get it straight in just a minute, was um, uh, not a stadium, but it was um, a great place where they could have games in it. And uh, I forget exactly the name of it at this second because I didn't plan on bringing it up. But it is a huge ruin that way it's a grand theater grand theater gymnasium that's the name of it and you can see the ruins of it there and I asked the archaeologist it was a teacher and a government agent at the same time I said now I want you to show me where Paul preached and I said now if you don't know don't tell me because what you tell me I'm going to believe you 
And I go back, and I don't want to lie to my people and all the people that will hear me. I said, if you don't know, don't tell me. And so they took me and said, there. That's the Grand Theater Gymnasium, and that is where Paul preached. And they said, in fact, that's the only place he could preach. They said, uh, in uh, this is lower Ephesus. This was lower Ephesus. You go up that way and go up the hill, and that's exactly what you'd see. It's lined with the statues of uh, emperors and great Romans and great Greeks and Plato and Socrates and uh, Julius Caesar and the baths of Rome and all those, all, you see, just everything, all marble. Everything is marble. And so they said it couldn't be up there because only the elite lived up there. The elite Romans and the elite Ephesians, rich multimillionaires. They, yes, they had them back there too. And uh, God bless them. But Paul, they said, had to preach down here in lower Ephesus. That's all right. Sometimes we have to preach in buildings like this. Yes. And I've seen churches that were across the tracks. Amen. Amen. And I've seen them in halls. Yes. And many a time I've preached in a hall, and I don't mind it a bit. Yes. Amen. And a lot of times we didn't have the biggest cathedral. Sometimes it wasn't, but we was there. We was there. We was there, and we swamped them. We had the big, and they said that's where Paul preached. And so um, uh, it is thought that Paul may have seen as many as 20,000 of the Ephesians converted, and it was much bigger, and is a much bigger deal than you and I have ever thought possible. When they said a mass, a large number adhered to the apostles. We may think of five or ten or twenty. It might have been five hundred or a thousand at a clip. On the day of Pentecost, hundred and twenty. The same day of uh, hundreds more. In the next few days, five thousand more. They poured into the kingdom. All well and good. Paul preached throughout Asia Minor. He went to... Uh, uh, the island there and he preached on it and he went on across to Perga uh, in Turkey. I've been there and uh, I've been in uh, in Macedonia and Iconium and I've been uh, in many of those places and by the way I had my pictures taken there so I could prove it. Uh, I guess that if people would listen to me they could think I was a braggart because I've been all the way from China to Ephesus to Turkey to Oh, dear God, I don't know where all... I, it's easier now nearly to say where I haven't been. But I have been those places, and the reason why I wanted to go there is I want to know what it's talking about. I've seen where Leonard Woolley dug. I've been where Mellowin, the great archaeologist, and uh, Mellert and Mellowin and Woolley, Leonard Woolley, I've been to their places when I'd write about... I wanted to know. I want to know, God, am I telling the truth or am I telling a lie? And so I would go. And um, one place where I was was the ancient city of Uruk, U-R-U-K. This off of uh, history for just a minute, but uh, I, I want to tell you about it just briefly. There is a place in um, Iraq. Uh, you can see it now. It's called Uruk. It's on an arm of the Euphrates River, and it's 35 miles across a blazing, burning desert. And uh, they, they told me about it, and we was going by there, and the, my guide, he said, there's no road in and no road out. If you go there, you take your life in your own hands. But I wanted to go, and I was young and reckless, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go because I wanted to know. And so that desire to want to know has driven me on and on, or something did, and I wanted to know. So I've gone through many years of my life uh, searching these things out so that you may know too. Now, all right, so we go to the fact that Jude, they, they crept in. There's masses saved by Paul's hand, Peter, James, John. They preached all the way to Malabar, India. And uh, Glastonbury, England. We're going to document this. I'm going to show you where we get it from. I'm going to, I don't have to prove anything like Sister uh, uh, was talking to me the other day. She said, we believe you, uh, Sister Jeffers, but I, I want to show you. And I, I would feel good if you'd say, read that to us. Yes. I'll feel good if you challenge me on something. Because if I can't, uh, if it doesn't stand up here, it may not stand up later on. 
but in the years nothing has ever been disproved on us not yet anyway so here is where certain men crept in now if you'd read 1 John 2.19 you'll find there I'm not going to read it but you can write this down they went out from us now here is a going out now I want to I want to take uh, take you back into church history. I want to show you uh, where this started, the roots of what we see today, the formative roots in First John two nineteen. They went out from us because they were not of us, or they'd have continued with us. When men went out and left our religion there started false religions. Right. Now I'm going to show you where the, the roots of the Roman faith community started. We're going right back to those roots. Nearly all the people in my church are ex-Roman Catholic people. Nearly all of my people are ex-Roman Catholic people. Now you may not all be here, but in my church nearly all of them are. And they would come into my church and honest to God, poor little Mary Deercast when she came into our church uh, she wanted to get saved but yet when they come into your church and they hear you clapping your hands and say hallelujah glory this is wonderful hallelujah and clapping your hands Mary Deercast nearly fainted it scared her to death and then but she weathered the storm and got the Holy Ghost and she brought Lily and Rooney in and one person tells another Lillian was hungry for God she walked into our Pentecostal church and heard us preaching and shouting and testifying. She almost fainted. She never heard anybody in life say amen. Go down and sit down in a, a dead thing and never feel anything. She came in and felt the presence of God and almost passed out. And um, she got baptized today. But that is what happened. Now then, uh, so false religions have started. How? I'm going to show you how. And we're going to show you some that did it. 1 Timothy 1.20 Now some went out. This is right under right in our Bible and for years we've overlooked things in our Bible that's there and plainly. And he says, 119, holding faith in the good conscience which some having put away they started to putting away good conscience, Brother Rutledge, and uh, uh, made shipwreck. There were men that went out and they made shipwreck. Have you ever seen someone that was saved and for years they preached the truth and then something went, maybe a preacher, maybe even preachers. You've seen, uh, I've seen preachers, God help me, I've seen preachers come and I've seen them go in my 50 years did you ever see somebody that they came in for a while and got a little bit understanding of the truth and then something went wrong and they went out they backslid it happened back here alright they came in they put away faith and they made a shipwreck alright of whom here they go who started other religions of whom is Hermeneus and Alexander whom I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme they blaspheme God alright another they went out now I'm talking some crept in now brother Rutledge they're going out alright a, a second second Timothy 1 15 this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. They turned away from Paul, mind you. Yes. I've seen a few that turned away from our church, Brother Rutledge. Yes. O Lord my God, yes. of whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes, they backslid. Now these are great men. Yes. And, and the Lord have mercy. I want you to catch the infliction of word meaning here. See, we've missed these things for years. And Paul, almost with a sigh here now, and Paul probably is crying as he wrote this with that apostolic pen, 
You know all they that are in Asia, they, they turned their back on me. So Jealous led them away in Hermogenes. They turned them away. And they said, Oh God, they almost got Anes Ephras. They got him too, I guess. Paul writes this almost with a way of watch here. And he said, Oh Lord God, have mercy on the house of Anes Ephras. They got him too, I guess. There has been sad things that happened. All right. Now then, so we move on. The church grew and uh, there were millions by the end of the first century. Now we found it to give us something to go by. We have thought, well, the church died. It didn't die. I'm going to prove it to you now as we get into really some heavier uh, vein of history. From 150 to 218, who carried the truth on? Would you like to know? After the apostles passed. Now, it's easy enough to go down to the library and read all about the post-apostolic fathers. Now, that's easy to do. Anybody can do that. And that's all you are going to find. Some of, uh, I'm not going to speak very nice of them now, so you may as well get acquainted with me now. They were, they were not our people, and the ones they call the post-apostolic fathers, I'll name them for you. And the trouble is you hear men with, uh, 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 watch what I say here, men with not too good an understanding of history, and you hear men get up and glamorize these men, and they were not worth even the dirt under your fingernails. Right. You hear men, the post-apostolic fathers, mainly they mentioned five of them that we ordinarily hear about. It was Clement of Rome, Ignatius, it was uh, Polycarp, and it was uh, Shepherd Hermas, and it was Justin Martyr. None of those men were saved. They were not apostolic. Now, it doesn't matter what you say, and it doesn't matter what you think, and I will tell you something else now, and if I, you let me get a little bit careless for a minute. Now you can get a book and read all about champions of oneness. Yes. They weren't champions of oneness. No, and the guy that wrote that, I know him very well, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> There's plenty of people today that are telling you all about glamorizing Ignatius and Polycarp. Well, uh, uh, all right, I'll tell you what Ignatius did. He was mostly insane. And I'll tell you how to prove it. Now I'll tell you right uh, in... <laughs> In C. C. Richardson's book, Early uh, Early Church History, and on page 109, you can find where Ignatius went to. Uh, I want you to listen closely. Ignatius went to Philadelphia, and you can pick him up at Philadelphia. And that night, it was not our church at Philadelphia. He went to another one. By then, there was the an early split of. Uh, that was had the footnotes and the early earmarks of the ap- post-apostolic fathers' doctrine wasn't our doctrine, and they had go across town and start them um, uh, what became the Catholic system. They didn't want to listen. Paul said, "All they in Asia, they forsook me." Yeah. Now you don't think they went out in the world, do you? No, no they didn't go out in the world. Uh, Fagellus didn't go out in the world. He started in something else. Yeah. Hermogenes started him something else. Went out across town, started him something else. And uh, so uh, Ignatius came to Philadelphia, and that night he, he admit, I can let you read it. I have the books at home. And he said, I admit later on when I said, why did you act that way? He was in the uh, uh, an early proto-Catholic uh, assembly, and he screamed out his hate for the Jews. And he said, I admit that I got beside myself and started screaming. He started screaming and preaching his hate against the Jews. And I'll tell you this, all, you want to know why there was an Auschwitz? You want to know why there was a Buchenwald? You want to know why Hitler killed the Jews? It was anti-Semitism. And it wasn't new. Polycarp, Ignatius had it. They all had it. Every one of those, that are, and I can let you read where they were anti-Semitic. They Jew haters. Yeah. All right. Now then, 
Let's talk about another one that you often hear glamorized as a hero, and he was no hero, Polycarp. Everybody hears about Polycarp. Blessed old Polycarp. Don't say that. Please take it from me, don't say it. I want to blow that I want to blow his image to you right now. I want to tell you what he did. I'll show you where to find it and you go look it up. If you find that I'm wrong, you can tell me to leave and never come back. All right? That's how sure of the ground that I'm on. And I wouldn't tell you if I wasn't absolutely positive of what I am saying. All right. Polycarp the year is one fifty. Right on the dot. Polycarp is an enemy of oneness. He is an enemy of the Jewish people. And he hated the Jewish Christians that were everywhere. And he was not one of them. And in that year, he went to Rome. He went to Rome, Italy. And he went to, po uh, not Pope. There were no Popes. Not till about 420, 430. The, the pope Leo is the only thing that even looked like a Pope until 430. You've heard it all wrong. They tell you they're the first church. No such thing. I'll prove it. I'll back down anybody that they'll bring. Yeah. Uh, we'll back them down and make them retract that. Right. We were the church. Right. The Jesus name people were everywhere. And they were nothing. And I have many, to my, uh, Thursday night I have many things that I'll let you read and I'll prove it to you. I, I wrote it all down carefully. You can have a photo study copy of it. Okay. 150, uh, Polycarp left the city of... Um, Smyrna, he traveled to pre-pope, is pre-pope, Anacetius, A-N-A-C-E-T-U-S, Anacetius, 150. He went to Rome, and, and he went there to destroy Easter. He went there to destroy Easter. You know the 14th of Nisan? The Passover on the 14th of Nisan that Jesus celebrated, and Jesus, the Passover time was there, and Jesus took bread and break it and said to the disciples, take eat, this is my body. That was the celebration of Easter, the resurrection. And uh, uh, after three days, after three complete full days, Jesus rose from the dead. That would make it about the 18th of April if you'd keep Easter. But we don't know. Don't, uh, there's no use in trying. Because they've destroyed it. It's gone. We can't do nothing about it. You may as well leave it alone. But Easter would never come always on a Sunday. It can't be done. Does your birthday always come on a Monday? No. <laughs> it can't be done. But it takes a mathemat mathematical formula, and I have the formula at home, and it arrives at the first, full, uh, first Sunday after the first full moon. So many days they calculated. Rome did it. Thank them for it. Okay? So he, Polycarp destroyed Easter. And he destroyed everything else that he could get his hands on. And it was Polycarp that gathered up the early books of the Bible and took them to Rome, probably where they are down deep under the earth in their archives right to this day. They probably are. But no one's going to get in there. Okay. Now, who carried on? There was certain men, and you see there here, you may want to write this down. There was a man called Noetus, N-O-E-T-U-S. And he was the head of the Noetian party, great body of oneness people. There was another man easily found called Artemon, A-R-T-E-M-O-N. Now the most popular name that you'll find as a oneness was Praxis. P-R-A-X-E-A-S, Praxis. The next one that we still hear in the 20th century is Sibelius. Now, you find the, these names very easily in history books. Um, you find another by the name of Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N, and oh, they hated him, and oh, they hated him. But they, no, one, no one was hated like Sibelius. Good old Sibelius. You know what he meant? He's, they said, one God, one God preacher. Here comes old Sibelius, one God. He's one of them Jesus only. Here comes Artyman, he's just like him. Um, uh, Epigonus, another one was Epigonus. And they said, oneness are everywhere. And brother, they only named some of them, but there were thousands of them. There were thousands of men like them everywhere. 
from um, from Ephesus all the way to China. North Africa was full. And wait till you hear how what happened to the eunuch that went back about uh, Thursday night. And wait till you hear about the Malabar Christians. And wait till you hear about the Armenians. And wait till you hear about the Glastonbury Church. And uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of things that I'm going to try to tell you. <laughs> all right. Now, before time gets away from me anymore, I'm going to teach you uh, three or four words. Are you ready? These are Greek words, but I want you to learn them, and then you can study oneness history as well as I did. I'm going to give you my secret away. It's cost you a million dollars, but I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to give you away the key to finding your history. And if you don't know this, you'll never find it. Don't even waste your time. But if, you, if you'll do what I, I'm going to tell you now, you can go down to the library here in Boston or the big libraries or wherever there are libraries, and you'll find your history. All right? Modalistic monarchians. Write it down, and I'll tell you what it means. No, it's not bad words. <laughs> M-O-D. A-L. I S T I C modalistic monarchian M O N A R C H I A N. Now you say, Brother Arnold, what on earth are you trying to do? Why did we ever ask you to come out here? Okay? You asked me to come, now I'm gonna drill some things into you, and when you learn this, you're gonna know how to find uh oneness. Uh, apostolic history, and it's the only way on God's earth you'll ever find it. Took me 20 years to find it, and uh, if you read history books that don't have these three or four words in them, you'll know they don't know what they're talking about. And the next word is patripassion, P-A-T-R-I-P-A-S-S-I-A-N, patripassion. It really is a word. And it's not a bad word either. The next one is Sabellians. S-A-B-E-L-L-I-A-N-S. Sabellians. And uh, another word I'll give it to you is Artemonites. A-R-T-E-M-O-N-I-T-E-S. But you'll usually find the word Artemon. A-R-T-E-M-O-N. Now... What I want to do, I'm going to show you what these words mean. Hang on to your hat, because here is what you are. In case you don't know what you are, here is what you are. Modalistic monarchian. Look at the word M-O-D-E, mode. Now this is not modalistic, it is modalistic. One mode, you may want to write this down, one mode Worshipping one God. One way to worship one God. That's exactly what that means. And uh, Tertullian, the Roman Catholic lawyer, came up with those slander. It's slander. It is slander. You people may as well know in history you're slandered. You are slurred. You're bad-mouthed, if you want to use the word bad mouth. Okay, how many knows what it means to be slurred? These are slurs. Pure and simple. They don't like you. Cause they, and they say, that old, that, uh, that old brother, uh, Randall Rutledge, he's another modalistic monarchian. Uh, brother Arnold, he's just another one of those patripassians. He doesn't agree with the Lutheranism. He doesn't agree with uh, Zwinglianism and Calvinism. And he's just one of those patripassians. And that's exactly what it means. And you want to know really what history calls you Raise your little right hand. You want to know what history calls you? Heretic. In religious history, you're, you're a heretic. That's what the Rome called everybody. And at the Nicene Council, one of the fourth laws, fourth dogmas they passed, they passed about the, the triune Godhead, the Trinity Godhead, the triune water baptism, and the next one that was Easter, they made it concrete, uh, these things, dogma, they made them concrete at Nicaea at, in 325.
P-A and then put a dash. And put a T-R-I dash. And then put the word passion. P-A-S-S-I-O-N. Passion. Means to suffer. You ready? What on earth, Brother Arnold, are you telling us now? That word is the most valuable word that there is as a slander against us. It means pa, the father. Pa is father. Try the passion suffer. It means the father suffered. And oh, dear God, if you know what that means, it means that back yonder they were calling you Jesus only people. That's it. it the word patter passion more than anything else means Jesus only. And the world was full of Jesus only people. And you go down to the library now, give you a clue. L don't waste your time looking through history books. Don't waste your time. Let me give you a better clue. Go down and turn to the index in the back of a book. When you go to the library, it'll save you hours and months. Man, it took me ten years, I guess, to learn this. Go and look in the index right at the back, and it says, Modalistic Monarchy on page 21, turn there, and you'll find our history. If you don't, you'll never find it. And then look under the word Patrapashan in the index, turn to that page and read about them. You're reading about oneness, Jesus' name, just like you, just like Brother Arnold, just like Brother Rutledge. Amen. All right, so they called us that. Now I want to tell you about some of the other men. Uh, let me, uh, please don't get tired of me. Let me, I'll, I'll, not, I'll not hold you and hold you. But give me uh, a few more minutes here because I may never get back this way again. And if I teach you this, you're going to know it. And then if you get these books, you will find everything I'm telling you in these books. Everything is documented. You'll find footnotes, some, every book that I am mentioning, you can go to the library and get it and you will find the page that I refer to. So you can all become historians. Okay. In 144, there was an, another man by the name of Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. He had a whole organization and while I am teaching to you as fast as I can, there were always Jesus name organizations. Today, okay, today you have the ALJC, you have the PFW, you have the UPC, you have the PCI, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, about 15 of them. Okay, um, you have almost today, you may not know this, but you have nearly 100 Jesus name organizations at this hour. Now you may be shocked, but there no there's the UPC is just one of many uh, many. They may claim to be the biggest and best. They're not. They're not even the fourth biggest now. And I'm not speaking evil of anyone or anything, but uh, words tearing down bigotism, bigotism. Uh, when I was in China some years, uh, two years ago, just about now, uh, we were in, a, I saw a million and a half Jesus named Chinese. And on down in southeastern Asia, Brother Cobb that talked to us one night, he said, I know of another half a million. There are big organizations that we don't even know there. When I got in Tokyo, I didn't even know there's a church in Tokyo. I never heard of a, 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 a Tokyo Japanese church. Brother, just go there. Just go there and look around. They run from uh, uh, 100 and uh, five or six story buildings with elevators in them. They don't have churches like we have here. The Chinese, the true Jesus Chinese church, I was in them. I went in one and out of another until, Lord God, I was so tired that I thought I was going to fall apart. And they feed you in every one. <laughs> and Brother Rutledge, when you come out, you are, well... They just, you got to have a Coke. you got to have this. Oh, yeah, they have Coke and everything else that you have. And they dress just like you do, and they all talk English. And, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds. You go in one church that is probably 200 feet long this way. They go downtown in Taiwan. I know I've been there, and believe me, believe me what I'm telling you is true. And you, they'll take you in this. You say, that's a church? That's a church? And they go down by a complex, like a giant... Uh, uh, building 200 by 200 right on the street corner downtown Taiwan. Go straight up 
seven, eight stories high. They'll pool millions and millions of dollars and buy it. It's the only way they can get a church. It's got elevators in it and marble floors and everything else. And you think, this is a church. And they fill it up and then they go ten miles farther and buy another one. And uh, the, the saints all stay in the same church. They don't go, they won't let them transfer from church to church. Over there they have a real system. And when I heard Brother uh, Paul Wong take the scriptures and get up and preach, he'll preach repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, just one God, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Talking in tongues when you get the Holy Ghost. And that's, they go right down the line just like Brother Rutledge on and um, so there has always been Jesus name organizations starting out with uh, Noetus there were Noetians there were Artemonites there was followers of Praxis followers of Sibelius Manny Manny is a M-A-N-I is a very common name in religious history and he was a oneness now how you know that these men are oneness what I do when I am researching, I will go and I'll get the, uh, I have in our office at home, I have hundreds and hundreds of photostatic copies. And I have, I guess, hundreds of books and hundreds and hundreds of these. I have boxes of these. Now, when I find something in religious history that I never want to lose, I'll write it, get a photostatic copy of it and write it down and uh, I'll buy the books I have this book and I have many and then I find other things I will write them down where it is found the author the page and the name of the book the publisher and then I can't get mixed up and then I read it off and this tells you that un this page right here tells you until 350 and 450 there was only a handful of Catholics and I'll show you all of these different places I'll show you while I'm on it and while I have it, I'll show you where that uh, differently than what you've been told, even to 450, they didn't even have churches. And in the year of 450, all through Italy, they didn't even have 40 C's. Everybody knows what a C is. All right, uh, that's where there's a bishop and he's over a bunch of great area. And uh, uh, Louis Duchesne, in, uh, he said in all of Italy, there wasn't even 40 C's. And in A.D. 370, says so there's only a handful of Catholics in Africa. R.A. Knox, page 58. We've not been told the truth. We were the dominant church. Yes, sir. We were the same, but we were not recognized. Right. We've never been recognized. Right. They don't care nothing about what God said or Acts 2.38 says. They care nothing. What, they, they tell you what they want you to think that Peter said. We know what St. Peter said. They don't care. And there's millions of good people today that are waiting to get saved. And they would get saved, but they don't know how. Right. So it is a good idea not to condemn them uh, uh, too badly because a lot of people get saved like they do on here and in Martha's uh, Vineyard over there in uh, uh, Mass, and, but they don't know how. Okay, now then, there is something else. There was Montanus, M-O-N-T-A-N-U-S, and he lived in 157. And this is where the world suddenly, there had been 150 years of, uh, 130 years of tongue-speaking people everywhere, but in the year of 157, tongue-speaking suddenly struck some historian. He started writing about Montanus, M-O-N-T-A-N-U-S. Montanus, and he was the head of the Montanist. It sounds like Montana, but it is Montanus. And it was the year of 157. And in the year of 177, um, Arrhenius, uh, a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Arrhenius, he went to Lyons, France. I'm talking about the widespreadness of Pentecostal people in A.D. 144, 157. These are dates that I can document with because I find the definite date and the definite documentation. So I can legally say so. Okay? Uh, and so in the year of 177, Arrhenius, Bishop Arrhenius, haughty, heady, high-minded, one of those that you read about, 
he went to Lyons, France. The year is 177, right on the dot. And he said, quote, uh, in uh, Augustus uh, Neander's book, uh, Early History, you can see Neander's book, and um, page 47, 49, I have it right here. And he said, as Arrhenius looked around at Germany and France, southern France, northern France, and uh, uh, those places, he said, there are nations, there are nations of people that have the Holy Ghost and the word of God written in their hearts and their tongue speakers. He said, there are nations of them. What I'm telling you is we've underestimated our great legacy. Yes. We've never realized the magnitude of what we have done. Now I'm going to, I'll throw in quickly uh, uh, for good measure, uh, people today in America when, remember, this is not the old world. This is not the eastern hemisphere that you and I live in. We live in a western hemisphere separated by the Atlantic Ocean. The apostles didn't preach over here. They couldn't, or Borneo or Australia. So therefore, the widespreadness of our doctrine could not have been here, and consequently, at the time of Azuzu, because we, as very unlearned Americans, forgive me, I'm not slandering your intelligence, but we are very afar off. Bible says afar off. We're afar off. And um, um, so they said, looked around at Azuzu and, and at Topeka and they said, where's all the Jesus name people that you talk about in the Bible? Of course you don't see them. This is America. Of course the apostles didn't preach over here. Right. Of course there's not 10 million because they've never heard. But I'm going to tell you now, in the year of 1660 in America, there was 160,000 tongue speakers in the United States alone. When they tell me about Azuzu, I just tell them, don't tell me that. I know better. They say, our church started Azusa. I said, is that so? In the year of 1665, all through New England, it says there was 160,000 people that believe in speaking in other tongues. All right. The year, if I can find it, something I'll tell you now while it is fresh on my mind and while I'm drilling into you everything that I can possibly give you uh, in the year of 1660 um, in the year of 1660 about the same time in England the British Parliament passed the um, um, get this straight here the Conventicle and Five Mile Act now that is the exact name they passed a law called the Conventicle and Five Mile Act in England. And they uh, deported the Quakers and tongue-speaking Shakers from England. That's the name of them, Shakers and Quakers. And Anne Lee came to the United States and landed right down here. She brought tongues with her, 1772. Uh, Jemima, Sister Jemima, that really is a name. It's not only on syrup, but it is... Uh, Jemima was a woman with her. They were tongue speakers. And in the, those years, there were no less than 160,000 uh, uh, tongue speaking people, and many of them were baptized in Jesus' name. And Dan Huntington ba baptized people in Jesus' name in Boston in the year of 1850. All right. And in the year of 1888, Oscar Vili, I know his son. Know his, uh, I know his son, now, uh, Alvin E. Vealy of uh, Oki Pinocchi Swamp of Florida. Oka, Oka Pinocchi. Swamp of Florida, when the Seminole Indians went out, Jesus' only families followed the army in. I know men that were, uh, uh, I know their sons. Uh, I can tell you the, the, the son and the grandson and a great-grandson. I know two or three of them. And Oscar Vealy preached in my church. And he said, well, my father was baptizing people all up and down the Mississippi River in 1888. Yeah. We've got our wires crossed, neighbor. Yes, sir. I've got his books. In fact, the matter, I have Vealy's books, two of them. And the year of 1888 is right on there, and it says Acts 238. Yes. I've got them. You can come to my house, and I'll show you. Praise 
Praise the Lord. All right. We've got our wires crossed. There, the church never died. And our church has not been revived by some little group either. Thank God our church lived on. Uh, um, I'm just rambling on here as fast as I can. And um, there was another great man, Paul of Samosata. Paul, P-A-U-L, of S-A-M-O-S-A-T-A. Paul of Samosata. And Blunt, on page, you may say, how do you know that this great man, now you can read in history about Paul of Samosata, told how they hated him. And his followers were called Samosatines. Now you may wonder something here. A lot of our organizations, we are called different names in religious history because of the men that were evidently their leaders. And they would, met the historians, historians, uh, all they are is men. And they say, okay, now, how, here is how some of the names in religious history turned up. There was a man by uh, the name of Sibelius, 218, A.D. 218. And the whole world knew of Sibelius because he was a fearless, one God, Jesus name, devil chasing preacher. <laughs> and he went to Rome and he tore into uh, uh, Zephrenus, uh, pre-Pope Zephrenus, and, uh, and uh, it really did, and Callistus. And he tore them up. And he baptized the two, those two pre-popes in Jesus' name. He said, you're false. Don't tell me that Trinity stuff. And he got, he converted uh, Zephrenus and Callistus. I can, several times I can show you this in history. And they said, watch out. Here comes that Sibelius. <laughs> He's going to get you. He's one of those one God tongue talking Pentecostal holy roller preachers. And he's going to get you. And he was name was Sibelius. Okay. His followers, so the historians wrote about Sibelius. And in their ignorance, they called everybody that believed in oneness, they called them Sibelians. They were no such thing. They were Jesus' name Christians. Just like you. All right? And so they tell me that in Russia there are people that was converted under uh, an older brother Urshan and they call them Urshanites. All right. Uh, so it was. There was Paul of Samosata and uh, he preached Acts 2.38 and Blunt, J.H. Blunt on page 515 mentioned that he was a one God man. And they call him a Patripassian. So that's how I know they, they hooked the name. Oh, they said he was a Patripassian. So I, I, you mentioned Patripassian to me and I... Th- that's telling me why he was baptized in Jesus' name and had the Holy Ghost and he was a one God man because that's what one God people do. And if I never did see anyone as a true one God preacher, well, what they all, the same thing. Okay, now, uh, so there was Paul of Samosata and I've got just about enough time to tell you something that I want you to really hear now. I bumped into this word about two, not over three years ago before in all the research, I never found it in my life until about three years ago. I was reading the great uh, Malachi Martin. You've seen his books in the library. You'll see them there. Malachi Martin, and he wrote uh, one book called uh, uh, The Poet, Three Popes and a Cardinal. Three Popes and a Cardinal. And he, uh, Malachi Martin, is the great Roman Catholic Jesuit professor. He's he's rather young yet. And he wrote also another book called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Catholic Church. Now that's the name of it. And on page 42 and 43 of uh, Martin's Rise and Fall of the Roman Catholic Church. It tells about the word despoise me. I want you to write this down. 
D E S P O S Y N I. It, I want you to write the, these, mainly these words, the, several words I want you to write down. And then you're going to have them, and then you can check on later as time goes by and you see these references. You can go and check them out for yourself, and it'll make you a stronger Christian. Now, it may not start a revival. What I'm going to teach you may sound boring and all this and just nearly just uh, put your brains out. But I, I've got to do this while I'm here. And I, you haven't heard much yet. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I can teach you for days and days on this and never get this really all into your great brains. But that word, I pronounce it, despoise me. Despoise me. Say it with me. Despoise me. It's the only way I know to pronounce it. Now, when I was in school and what uh, schooling we got, uh, I've never found this word. But in the reference that I gave you, you'll find it. And this great Jesuit brother, he ought to know. He killed him. He helped kill him. Or his forefathers did. They killed the Jews. It says the year was 318. Right on the dot. And remember, Constantine, the Roman emperor, he became the emperor in AD 312. Right on the dot. He crossed the Melvian Bridge in A.D. 312 and the Roman Catholic Church immediately and concretely by A.D. 325 attached it to the Roman government. The year was 312. Always remember the date, 312. All persecution against the one that started in A.D. 312. I mean the main, the main slaughter that's lasted from then till now. It mainly started just the minute that that system, the Roman uh, religious system, got power with Constantine and became a state agency. We call it church state. It wasn't that. It wasn't church state. It was the state's church. The state's church. Now, there's a whopping big difference. The state-owned church. It was Constantine's church. And the slaughter started... When they got legal power, we were numerically dominant in every area. We could sway them any day. didn't matter. There, for every Roman Catholic, I'll guarantee you that there was possibly a hundred or two hundred Jesus names. And we could swap them by any number that they wanted to, but that didn't count. What are you going to do? We were unarmed. We were unarmed. We did not have in those days, of course, no guns or pistols or rifles. And the Jesus name people didn't even have a dagger. They could kill us. And after AD 312, when the small number of Roman Catholics attached themselves to the Roman Empire, and the priests would lead Roman legions against the, the Donatists and against the Montanists, and against the Manichaeans, and against the Despoisni, and a Roman legion came against you, led by a, a bishop or a priest, what are you going to do? Yeah. You get slaughtered or flee. And so they gain power, they gain military theological power over the whole world uh, after 312. And by, officially by... It became the official church in A.D. 325 when Constantine, his own self, presided over the Nicene Council as he sat there and watched them under lances of the Roman government. <clears throat> then they became the military force and they, uh, they decimated our numbers. They took our churches by force. That's how it happened. They... Okay. Now that is a story as near as I can put it together. And I believe me. I will tell you in uh, ego or not, I believe what I have researched and I sure do believe what we have found out. Now then, in closing, the despoisney. This you've got to have so you can sleep on it tonight. Despoisney means 
beloved of God. More than any other word, it means despoisney, beloved of God, and one that loves God. They were uh, a very special breed of men. These were mostly Jewish bishops. Now here are real, real bishops. These were men that loved God and they were around for seven centuries. Malachi Martin traced them for five centuries. But there's evidence that they were around as Jewish great leaders for seven centuries. They were descendants from Mary and Joseph or else from um, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were great Jewish people. They were like James, the brother of St. Peter. Remember, James was really, really, uh, 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 you might say, very strict Hebrew Jewish. Uh, James, more than St. Peter, was unbending. Uh, that's really true. The, the Apostle James. He didn't want to give in to anything. He, was, he would want to go to the Jewish people only. And Paul, see, God had to call Paul to go to the Gentiles. There was, all right. Now then, what I'm saying is, there were people like St. James, purely Hebrew, and they got saved on the day of Pentecost, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there on the day of Pentecost, and she was a tongue talker too. And so, from their children there came a line of men called despoisni, beloved of God, Jewish men that descended. This is the great, great Jesuit historian. If you can't believe him, you can't believe anybody. And on page 42 and 43, I found this, and it says they were descendants of Mary and Joseph. You see, Mary and Joseph had, uh, there was uh, Judas and the Lord Jesus and Simon and Joseph and uh, four children are me mentioned that Mary had aside from the Lord Jesus and, and daughters it's right in the Bible from that line there came great men and they did not perish until the fifth and the seventh and, and um, Malachi Martin in his book he said that the Romans hunted them like outlaws quote the Romans hated them and hunted them down like outlaws they'd kill them on the spot because they were one God people and this is what our church went through God bless you tonight um, God bless you um, I will have uh, many of these uh, I'll have many of these and look these over and see many many of the quotes and you'll find You'll find what I'm telling you in all of these, and it's as near official documentation as anything you can get out of Washington, D.C. Right. It's that. It is that uh, uh, real. And um, is there a question? I know I'm holding you five minutes too long already. Is there a question or a thought that I can? Yes. I might have, was it Neander? Did I mention? That was written, you can get it, um, it is written by, I know the man real, real well. The, it may have been, uh, I forget the man's name, he lives out there in Junction City, Kansas. I know him real well. I preached in his church. Uh, all of these books that, uh, in the back of this book, now there, nearly all the books that you will hear me quoting while I am, here are the books, here's the authors, and here's where you can get them. There's two whole pages here. And these are the most important books in the whole world. I mean from Oxford University of London and all, Uppsala, 
uh, Denmark, Sweden, Cologne, and places where we've